Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remco Rinkman. Today, I am joined by the 2016 Super High Roller Bowl champion, Reiner Kempi, one of my favorite Germans, to break down uh, his biggest final table. So, Reiner, first and foremost, how are you doing? How are you holding up? And, you know, we know it's been a strange year, but I hope all things are well. Yeah, everything's pretty simple over here. Um, nothing, nothing to complain about uh, spending, spending my uh, time in, in Vienna these days. Um, had, a, had a good summer, just, yeah, easy stuff, nothing, nothing big happening here. Um, so, yeah, on the good side. Awesome. I appreciate it. Well, uh, Reiner is giving up his soccer match tonight to be with you guys at home to break down this final table. So please, you know, show the man some love, show the man some support. Uh, I really think it's awesome to go back down to this final table. I was here when this happened. I have not seen it since. So I'm really excited to see um, what some of the biggest hands of this final table were. One thing I do remember is that you were the chip leader coming into the final table. So as we see the footage rolling of the introduction of this final table, comment by the way, by Aline Najat and Nick Schulman. We'll hear some of that later in the show. Um, how did you end up at the final table with the chip lead? Let, let's start there. Um, I think I, I don't even remember how I became like second or fourth in chips, but then there was this uh, this huge cooler hand against uh, Dan Smith that I actually do remember. Just said over said it, the poor guy. Um, and then I was yeah pretty pretty runaway. I think the chip lead was pretty pretty significant at that point. Um, I think it was like seven paid and I, um, yeah, he bubbled it and I was in a really good spot. Yeah, you were definitely in an amazing spot, and we'll see throughout this final table that you were man uh, you, that you managed to use that chip lead to your advantage. Um, however, back when you were at this final table, I think you were. And by the way, we're seeing the footage here uh, of the hand against Dan Smith. Let's listen in. Against Rainer Kempe's middle set. Sometimes that's what it takes to burst the bubble. That huge pop left Rainer Kempe as the overwhelming chip leader to start tonight's final table. Overwhelming chip leader. That is never a bad thing to hear when you're playing for $5 million. Um, let's go back in time a little further as we see Phil Helmuth, who snuck his way into the final table. How did you end up playing this tournament? Because clearly, you know, you've been around the block now. But up until that point, I'd seen you in some EPTs. But, you know, you were not known to me, at least, as a player who dabbled at these stakes. So tell me the story about how you ended up entering a 300k buy-in event back in 2016. Uh, yeah, I, I will in a second. I just for some reason hear like a ringing from my um, from my laptop. Okay, that's fine. Is it going just, away? Is it still there? I think now it's gone, which is a good. All right, cool. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I had I hadn't been playing uh, too much live poker until like 2015, and I had like a really good run, and um, and like many events just started. Started off at Aussie Million with like a second place in in like a big runner field, and then uh, I had like two EPT final tables and the WPT uh, final table, and then um, yeah, I I slightly I started playing um, playing high rollers a little bit, um, and then I think I think there was actually also Fedor who um, kind of asked me um, whether I would be interested in playing the Super High Roller Ball, and he claimed it would be the probably best uh, tournament of the year. Yeah, so I, I was convinced pretty easily and he, he already had um he had already been playing a few super high rollers and he had like the you know, he was connected to people who, who basically, you know, took the action. So it was super super easy for me to just like uh get in there. It was basically just Fedor kind of vouching to some some request and I had like some good results. Um and yeah, there we were. I mean, it's pretty crazy how simple you make it sound because the 300K buy-in, obviously, for most people is, you know, forever out of reach. But you had the results, you had the connections, and then you ended up in the event. Um, I'm kind of curious, though. W were you telling yourself, like, okay, I'm going to take a big shot because Fedor told me this is going to be a big moment? Or were you saying, like, well, I mean, I would love to play, but, you know, it's still a big part of my role if I'm, if I'm going to put big money down for this? Yeah, I mean, if you... Like in, in US dollars, um, the, the amount that I had in it was like fairly significant for myself in like percentage. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a huge piece. It doesn't, it's not going to sound very um, impressive. Like I don't even know the, the uh, exact number anymore, but um, yeah, it wasn't like I had, I had my, my house on the line or anything. Right. 
I mean, that, that is something funny uh, over time that sort of evolves. And I know players that are willing to put their house on the line or their livelihood in, in the case of someone like Bryn Kenny, who is also at this final table. Yeah. Um, but you, you've taken a, a bit more of the, um, I guess, smarter approach as far as, far as bankroll management. Um, when you come into a final table like this with the chip lead and there is, you know, so much money at stake, um, do you feel pressure? Do you feel adrenaline or is it easy for you to sort of s stay focused in the moment? No, I mean, for sure, I um, I felt the pressure. Like, it was also a four-day tournament, so we had been playing a lot of poker um, until this. Maybe it was three-day, no, it was four-day, right? Yeah, it was four-day event. I'm yeah. not 100%, yeah, I'm not 100 sure. Um, so, yeah, I was just, like, I was exhausted, and uh, it's, it's stressful. But I feel like, for me, the difference between whether it's a $300,000 or a $25,000 um, tournament isn't that, isn't, like, that that big anymore. It's, like, it's both absurd money, and whether there's, like, a zero, an additional zero behind it, it's kind of, you know, it's just, yeah, you, you kind of lose lose focus on it. So I feel like I would have been in a similar amount of um, nervous and stress um, if the buy-in had been uh, somewhat smaller. Right. And I think also that over time you get really numb to both the buy-ins and, and the payouts, right? Or, or you know, is, is that something that still comes into your mind every now and then? I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure you don't block it out completely. Like if you... If you get busted in a big buy-in tournament, you are going to be more frustrated than if it's a if it's a one k. But when it comes to the decision making, I feel like I don't have it too much within my thought process. It's just like you know, it's big blinds. It's it's you know, yeah. It's like like, like the the um the, the systems that apply in a hundred dollar tournament are kind of the same that that apply in a three hundred three hundred k. So uh, from that perspective, I don't I don't think it's like too much of and like i don't feel like i'm freezing or anything if the buy-in gets gets big right as far as your skill level back in 2016 compared to now how would 2020 reiner do against uh, 2016 reiner um i mean i th i do think 2020 reiner would run over 2016 reiner um but like in comparison to the field um I don't know. I I'm not sure. I think um, I think I had a really good edge in this in this tournament. I think yeah. I mean I don't. It's obviously super tough tough to say, and you don't play too many of them. Um, but I'm I'm not sure I would do better now in in the field than I did four years ago. And yeah, that's an interesting thing to note as well as how the average level of play has has gone up significantly. Um, what are places that you've improved on? If if you can sort of compare yourself to back then, like what are are there specific things that you're better at, or is it just more layers of experience that help you just make better decisions in general? Um, I think, I think back then um, I got, I got away away with like, you know, doing things that, that work, like, you know, just population did or didn't do th certain things in certain, certain spots that they should do. And the better uh, population got and doing the things right. Um, you know, it, it's got, it's gotten a lot harder. So I feel like the, the skill set was um was very fitting for 2015 14 13 and this even though it's 2016 is probably field wise more like a you know 14 kind of tournament um so yeah it wasn't like a super technical game even on the highest stakes and that obviously changed uh, significantly within 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 a fairly short time right uh, for the people who are new to this show let me just remind you this is run it back we are breaking down epic footage from the past and today i'm joined by the winner of the 2016 super high roller bowl mr reiner Kempi, who won five million dollars in this event that we are watching right now if you don't want to hear us talk which i can totally understand go on over to pokergo.com right now to watch this final table without us talking over it so you can just pick and choose do whatever you want i also want to remind you Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, do all that good stuff. This show is live twice a week and upcoming Thursday. I'm watching High Stakes Poker with my man, Scott Seaver. So we have a lot of exciting action coming up. But today we are diving into this final table, which is the 2016 Super High Roller Bowl. Reiner, this final table in particular, did you have specific mental notes and approaches in mind for the opponents at this final table? Like, did you have a lot of experience and sort of, I guess, I want to call it reads, but maybe you know, there's a better term for for it, but how did you sort of approach this final table? Mm -hmm. I mean, I do remember we went through, um, like in a small group, we kind of just went through the, the field a little bit, just like, you know, especially because there's a few people who you very rarely play with, who like basically only come out once or twice a year. Um, and then it just like helps to have a few informations on what to expect. So we did that. 
Um, but to be honest, I probably played with uh, with with Shaq a little bit, and I played with Fedor a good amount. Um, probably Bryn, but the rest. I mean, I'm fairly sure I hadn't played with um, Berkey before the beginning of the tournament, and oh, I played with Sadel obviously, but not with Helmuth at the time. So it's just yeah, I, I was also coming up. I hadn't played a bunch in the states, so there's like a good amount of of new faces and like a lot of guesses in regards to uh, to tendencies. Right. So. Is there something in the high stakes world where you guys study footage and, and watch other broadcasts to get caught up with, you know, playing styles and things like that? Or is it more about the fundamentals of the game and your own personal, you know, evolution of strategy? Um, I mean, we did, there was like, there were like some, some, some databases or something where, where we, um, where we had the, the uh, live footage just like, broken down into into statistics basically um but honestly for the most part it's it it wasn't as professional as you would think it would be for the buy-in like i didn't have have a lot of uh information it was just like you know basically two to five um random notes which might be right which might be wrong on on every player and so that's kind of what what we went with um or what i went with um yeah yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting to look back at this. And we'll break down as many hands as we can here on this broadcast. So if you guys in the chat have any questions for Reiner about this final table, about poker strategy, about how to win 5 million bucks, he probably has the secrets. So please send those in on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you are watching the stream. Really much appreciated. I already see um, Brad from Canada watching. I see Samad from Iran. I see Dave from Chattanooga, Tennessee. We already got an international crowd going here. And uh, I see some people on Facebook as well chiming in. Fauzan, Ivan, Jean-Louis, Bob, and Zelby. So if you want to interact with us, please do so in the chat. Dan Shack here. That sounds like a good mix of people. Yeah, we have a good mix of people. No one, no one from Vienna yet. So I'm kind of waiting for for the the Germans and the and the Austrians to uh, to join. They're all playing soccer. <laughs> yeah, they're all Thursday, Tuesday evening. The Tuesday evening soccer I, game. I mixed up the time zones. So I I messed that one up. See, that's the thing. Reiner committed to doing this before he figured out that he would miss soccer. So, you know, this is, this is a lucky situation for me. Yeah. The credit you gave me for, like, choosing this over soccer, I, I, I didn't deserve. Well, I mean, I, I do owe you one in, 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 regard, in regards to giving up soccer. I know, I know how important that is. Um, let's talk a little bit about the dynamic with Fedor. Um, obviously, he was the one who convinced you to play. He is, you know, a stellar player recently, had a ton of success as well online again. Uh, just when you think you get rid of him, he comes back and he just smashes everyone. So what is it like to play at a final table with someone who I believe is, is a good friend, someone who, you know, may, you know, you guys might have a swap, something like that. So what is it like to be in that spot? Is it, is it, is it possible at all to ignore that? Um, I mean... It's it's hard. Like it's it wasn't the first time this this happened. Like when we played like small, small smaller buy-in fields in I don't know Cyprus or whatever. We had like we had like similar situations um, before, be it with Fedor or somebody else that you like, you know, just that you like. Um, and I don't know. I I always felt like we could we could keep those things things separate very well. Like I never felt like anyone was angry at me for busting him or the other way around. Like these kind of dynamics. Um, when really in in that group, which is obviously which helps a lot. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard it's really hard to say because like sometimes there's just situations where you don't know for sure, and then it's it and it does end up being like a bit of an emotional uh, decision. Um, and so yeah, it's really hard to to stay objective with it. Like I do believe that we all always try to. Uh, to like do the do the right thing and just ignore those things, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard to really be sure if there were like situations where you might make the call if you, you know, if you didn't like the guy or whatever, some some something something foolish. Yeah, it is interesting because of course you guys clash throughout this final table, and you know we won't just give away how this thing is going to end, even though we know that you're going to win. Uh, but there are definitely quite a few interesting hands. Um, in this case, we have uh, Fedor having the ten with the gut shot, and you just have. Um, the double gutter right here on the turn, betting 150k into 270. If my you math, know the, math is correct, do you know the the positions? Um, I do not see a button, so it. Let's see. Can we see the button? 
I don't see the button. Which is always important, of course. It looks to me as though Fader raised and you called from the big blind. Goes check, check. And, and then you check back and I... You lead, you lead the turn. So in, go again. in this in this spot, you know, it, does his range still connect too much with the board to continue, or or is this actually quite okay for you to bet the river here? I mean, you probably ideally want to have a, you probably ideally want to have a clap in your hand to follow through, um, but also his check back range is um, on the flop is already so strong that I probably don't do a lot of bet turn and uh, and check river. It's just yeah for all those jacks set. Pocket jacks, pocket kings, queen, king queen, queen jack, king ten, jack ten. Like those are always going to be easy calls on the turn because they have the, the additional equity with the gut shot. Um, but a lot of them are going to give up the river. So I feel like a big part of my bluff, bluffs is going to go bad turn, bad river. Also, my value hands will probably do the same thing. Right. Yeah, okay. I don't. I'm not surprised. I decided to follow through with it. Nice. Uh, question here coming in on Facebook. Timo is asking, is dressing up an intimidation strategy? I remember you wa watching you that tournament. Congratulations once again. So explain to me the, the jacket and the scarf. Like, was that intimidation? <laughs> uh, it wasn't intimidation. Um, there was like a, a dress code. It was the first tournament I've ever played with a dress code. So it was, I think, business casual is what it was called. And in the first like this was the first time they had it and it was actually being taken somewhat serious. Like, I mean, there was like one jumpsuit in there, but besides that, everybody else was like, you know, kind of taking it serious. Um, I didn't own anything that would qualify as, at, uh, as business casual at the time. So um, yeah, the day before or something, I, I tried to, I just, I, I went to like a store at the, close to the area and tried to get a suit. Um, and that's, that's where it ended up. I mean, it, it, uh, it looks... Fashion, fashion device by Dominic Nietzsche. Oh, that's, that, that, is, now that is a side street that I wouldn't really walk down too often. Yeah. But yeah, are you, are you I, looking back on it? Are you happy with the jacket? Do you still own it? Is it part of the rotation? I, it's not part of the rotation, but I do still own it. I don't think I've... Uh, this, was my, this was probably the last time I wore it. But I do think... It looks it looks better in person than uh, than on, on screen. <laughs> um, it's well, kind of it's kind of a cool jacket. Yeah, no, I think it looks great, and I think that you know sitting next to Bryn Kenny makes you look even better. Yeah, he was he was the one who didn't take business casual too too serious there. Uh, shout out all the, also to Matt Berkey, who, who as you can tell is wearing a custom tailored suit. You know that is that is a look that is. Uh, I mean, you hardly ever see that ever in a, in a, in a book tournament. Um, people on YouTube. He might, have, he might have had one for, for every single day too. Oh, doing the old Marcel Lusk play. Marcel Lusk would always come to the WSP main event in Vegas. He brings seven suits for seven days because the main event used to be a seven-day tournament. Um, here goes Helmuth, obviously, with the nuts. Um, Bryn doesn't have it. He did have a flush draw on the flop, and he gives it up rather quickly. Um, the the Phil Helmuth experience, you know, it, it it is something truly unique in the game of poker. Um, how do you, how do you look at him as both, you know, someone who is at the top of many lists and rankings, um, but at the same time he has his own unique style and and then of course the the you know flaming flaming personality, I would say. Um, I mean, I'm I've always been like a big fan, like just I I I enjoyed the interactions I have with him, um, like outside of the table, for sure, like he's just like a pleasant, uh, nice guy, actually. Um, and on the table, you know, he's he's less of a pleasant, uh, nice guy for the most part, or at, at least occasion uh, occasionally. But I, I don't know. I don't mind. Like, I will. I let him get a, get away with it. It's you know, he's if if somebody else would act that way, uh, it would be weird. And he's just kind of allowed to do it at this point, in my opinion. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm always surprised that there there's people like even like good pros who kind of get get super annoyed at it um i don't know I'm, i don't know it's kind of kind of his privilege for being for being in there so long right as far as the fame of of someone like phil helmuth and you telling your friends and family back home that you play poker you play in these big tournaments are the names like helmuth negranu esfandiari and ivy those the names that people will even know in germany how, how is how is sort of the how, how are the poker players perceived over there back home um i mean we definitely have way less of of this this culture where um 
they're like idols or like where people look up to them. I, that's just not really a thing. Gambling in general is, um, I think in German culture, it's just not that that deep deep in it. Like if you if you tell somebody you you go to Vegas to play 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 poker tournament, then you probably like you have a problem in in most people's opinion. And it's not you know in 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 the US, it's like a good story to tell that you sold your car, you went to Vegas and you gambled away the money that you got for the car. Like people tell that story and there's a lot of nodding on the table and it's fine, you know? Um, and in Germany, that wouldn't be a thing. So, so yeah, like the, the Ivies and Finigrianos, especially they are probably known because there was like doing the, doing the hype, doing the boom. It did like, you know, it did uh, run in television a good amount of time. Um, but besides that, the media interest is, is super limited. Um, was there media interest for 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 this final table for this result for you and Fader going heads up and and you know you ultimately becoming the winner? Was there attention paid to that in 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 the media? Um, I really don't think so. Actually, I think yeah, wasn't I didn't I can't can't remember anything. Um, yeah, I mean I remember like it's it's weird they if they if they do pay attention they. They, it's always like in a or very often in a negative way. Right. Like I, I remember a friend playing uh, heads up uh, for for the bracelet in Vegas, and like it's it's basically he, he ended up being second for like I don't know eight hundred k or something instead of one point one million, and then a German uh, a German newspaper like a big one um, did actually pay attention, and the the headline was something along the line uh, German. 28 year olds gambits away million dollar chance or something like that which is like a weird take on the situation right um so yeah it's not it's not that yeah it's it's very much frowned upon i believe right that's so that's such a i mean frustrating thing to have to deal with you know it's of course you know you're not looking to be on tv shows and to be famous in germany i i can sort of make that assumption uh but at the same time you know, a, a bit of positive um, news wouldn't hurt anyone. Um, what's the, what's that like for your for your friends and family back home who aren't poker players? Like, do they understand? And at what point did they start understanding? Like, was was this something that we're like, oh, actually, he's he's doing quite well? Like, how, how, what was that like? Yeah, I feel like for that for that this one was a turning point um, because yeah, because once you it's it's just something once you you hit with the, these kind of numbers, it's something people. Kind of talk about and it's like mentioned and then you know it's kind of kind of connected to you at this point um yeah so so um before that i don't know i i'm not sure what people thought i did before that um but yeah this definitely uh put me put me me and poker on the map like together in in people's perceptions i suppose right yeah and and clearly you you still have the footage to f forever look back on, so this memory will you know sort of live on in in, in that sort of way, which is really cool. Um, are there any other things that stand out from the whole experience of playing this event? Because clearly, you know, this stage and this event have a bit of a different feel than most of your of the regular tournaments that you that you play throughout the year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember, I do remember like going to the table and like people just greeting each other with with a handshake like i think yeah just yeah very very different feeling going to like talal, talal who i hadn't met before and just like being introducing each other and like shaking a hand and just being doing like some polite small talk uh, before like, you know it felt more like a like a fancy dinner table kind of setup than than what we we we're used to um so yeah definitely I mean, just the just the whole setup between the cameras and there's nobody else in the room. Right? It's like an empty, it's a, it's fairly empty room with just the tables and you you uh, you know the just what's the word? Anspannung. Help help me out. What is it? The tension. The Ten tension in the room is just like you know. It's it's very it's, yeah. It's, in, it's intense. Um, and that doesn't really compare um, with other tournaments. Also, there wasn't any late registration or anything. You registered. You, people people were, were there on time except Phil maybe but everybody else you know they just sat there they waited for it to start and that's also yeah that helps um giving this whole thing a bit of a competition and um wait I I have somebody joining in you have a guest I do have a guest 
I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious to see who will who will roll up. I have a I have a date with the with the Remco over there. I know. I was watching. Of course, I was watching. Oh, there's Fedor. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> Fedor, uh, good. Uh, you really you really have to respect uh, how, how serious he's taking this. Uh, he's, he's skipping our very serious weekly soccer match. I'm so tonight. bad with time zones. So bad. <laughs> Fedor, Fedor, this this just means that you know now you have no more excuses. If if Rainer can give up one game of soccer, then then you must also do that. I'm re I'm ready to go. Remco just told me there's a Thursday there's a Thursday session for this, so you don't even have to miss soccer. Is that right? Yeah, but the Thursday session is very late. It is uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time, so it's in the middle of the night. I'm committed. Still better. <laughs> uh, Fedor, one question before you run out: uh, Good memories or bad memories of this final table because you came so close. I mean, yeah, pretty damn good memories. Like uh, one of my closest friends won it, and uh, I, uh, I came second. We chopped it heads up. So uh, yeah, it was ob obviously fine. I mean, financially, probably the biggest uh, win of my career, and uh, just overall a really, really awesome experience. So it was very exhausting. It was probably one of the most exhausting tournaments I ever played, um, but it was really fun. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I'm glad you got to join us here for just a minute. Uh, for the people who are watching, Fedor is joining me on Run It Back probably next week. So we'll have to find a, a good way to schedule that out. And um, we'll watch probably one of his uh, big wins from over the years. Uh, Fedor, good luck with the game. I, I appreciate you stopping by. Cheers. Have fun, guys. All right, that was Fader, Hol Fader Holtz just casually stopping by to uh, to join us here on the show. I, I even completely forgot what we were talking about, but... Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter for the people in the chat uh you know don't don't forget to like this video and and send in your questions if you have them for uh for reiner or for myself and just a quick reminder as well um high stakes poker is coming back we have all seven seasons available on poker go season eight will be filmed at a later point this year at the poker go studio when it's all safe and when we can do that you know with regards to corona um reiner high stakes cash games is that is that something that you're ever interested in? That you dabble in that at all? Is is that something that a tournament player like yourself sort of shies away from? Um, I mean, I've I've been I've been playing a little bit like live live cash games, um, but but yeah, I I don't know. I don't like the the politics around it too much. I don't. Um, I I mean I mean you know what I just explained about this tournament in. Uh, in uh, particular, was just the uh, you know everybody's there, everybody starts, everybody can get in. Uh, there's no like waiting list. There's no um, waiting for for the spot or something. It's just like you're there, you play, and that's the great thing about like tournaments. If you're good enough to play them, um, then then you can just do that. And then cash games, it's it's a little a little bit tougher. Um, and yeah, and online it's just incredibly hard. Like I I'm just like not good enough in uh, in cash games to play uh, high stakes cash games online. Like those people, uh, those guys are like incredibly incredibly good. Yeah, it's definitely a different sort of universe. Uh, while we see Helmuth and Shaq, wow, that was a quick shove there from Helmuth with the Pocket Kings. Shaq has the tens with the uh, gut shot as well. Um, Reiner, walk me through this. Is there any way Shaq can get rid of this? I mean, no. <laughs> to start it off with a, with a very clear no, especially like the, the gut shot uh, with it. And the odds, like, you know, even now he nearly has the, the percentage he needs. And if there's like the occasional flush draw in there, uh, he's always going to be golden. He could have also like, he could be snap jamming with, what's the, what's the action preflow? It's three by pot? I believe it's three by pot, yeah. I think Shaq calls out yeah, of position. So I mean, there could be, there could at least be like ace king, ace king of diamonds uh, type of fence. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, Phil tends to like show up with the, uh, with, some random holdings, which he might not snap jam on the um, on the on the flop, but maybe if it's like an eight five or like a seven five, like a pair and an open and sweat, or he might. So there's just like so many so many things, and hence is obviously a great hand and with, with the gut shot. Um, yeah, what, what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. What? Then told me, then Shaq told me with like 35 people left and both of us being a short stack that we're both final table this event, and he's not really. I mean, I hadn't known him very well, but like, I don't think he's much of a, you know, fortune teller in that way. Like, he doesn't really, he doesn't really do that. That's the only time I heard him do it, and uh, he was right. Yeah, he was, he was, he was cashed. 
Yeah, that, that, that's really cool to see. I love, I love the passion that Dan Shack has for the game. I think it's just tre tremendous to see how much this guy you know, cares about poker and how much he loves to compete. And uh, this one went Helmut's way. Of course, you know, life's pretty easy when you pick up Pocket Kings into 10s at a final table like this. But yeah, a lot of respect for Dan Shack, who's been mixing it up with the big guys for many, many years. And he's had tons of success as well, which is easy to forget. But yeah, he's always been um, a real, a real, real competitor, I'd say, a real, a real grinder in some of these tournaments. Um, the, the pay gems at this final table were obviously massive. Um, is that something, maybe not in this event, but in general, that you as a tournament player has to pay attention to as far as ICM considerations? Or is there a certain level where, you know, the buy might be a little bit lower and you're like, ah, I don't really care about these pay jumps, even though ICM says this, I might do that because, you know, the ultimate chance of winning the tournament is more important to me. Yeah, I don't think you, um, you play a lot of tournaments that you don't care for the pay jumps on the final table, right? Like how, like, you know, that's just not something that happens. Um, maybe occasionally there's like something about first place that makes first place uh, especially valuable, I guess. You know, like if if somebody very successful plays a, plays like a bracelet event and there's a, like 200K first place, then somebody like Negriano or somebody like Harry Muth uh, is very likely going to value the, um, the, the bracelet more than, than the money. Um, I'm, I would very much say I'm not part of that, of that group. Um, so yeah, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a $500 buy-in tournament or, or this, I will always uh, allow ICM to handcuff me a little bit. That's yeah. a, that's a funny thing to say because you play such big buy-ins all throughout the year that you still find a way to make the various levels of buy-ins sort of mean the same thing as far as your approach. That's kind of impressive, actually. Um, sure, but also in, on, on average, the, uh, the final table is going to be, you know, a lot, it's going to happen a lot less often in the small buy-in tournaments just because of the, of the number of people in it. And it's like, it's like then suddenly the pay jump is from 15 to 25 buy-ins and from like 80 to 110 buy-ins. Um, while those pay jumps, like the main cash is what, like two and a half buy-ins and the, the heads up is like another four buy-ins. Like if you if you look at it this way, um, the the the, um, the pay jumps on on the bigger, on the on the smaller buy-in final tables are usually even more significant. Um, but but yeah. Not, so, so not sure how to finish the sentence or where exactly I was going with it. No, but what I'm curious about then is, uh, for someone in your position who plays high rollers, who can plays, we see, can we see? Can we see what Phil says? I don't want to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's see. I've I've been I'll, dealing I'll, with I'll, that for. I'll go back and. Andy Frankenberger's pick, Phil Helmuth. I take a lot of heat and a lot of criticism, so for me, there's always a little extra pressure, you know, as the all-time bracelet winner as someone who's at the top of the poker world, you know, uh, you're just gonna, you, there's gonna be more heat on you. And that's okay, I accept that. I've, I've been dealing with that for 10 years. I mean, the fact that he just casually drops in that he has 15 bracelets, you know, that's like a drinking game. If, if you guys are at home in a time zone where drinking is allowed, then you have to take a shot right now. So All right, there? what is this hand? Oh. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. What what I said about uh, why you can't fold tens because like there's always some random, some some random combination that you wouldn't expect. Like I think I'm getting three bet from the big blind here. Yeah. So you raise, you raise under the gun with Ace Jack, and he three bets from the small blind. Is that what's happening? And I think he's three bets from the big blind, and I open under the gun plus one. And we're six handed. So. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Berkey, hijack, Berkey, hijack versus Berkey is supposed to. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So in this situation against someone like Helmuth, who's known to be a very tight player, does Ace Jack shrink in your head immediately when he does something like that? Um, I think I've seen a hint before the final table where he did something similar. But yeah, I definitely wasn't expecting um, that kind of, of a hint, I think. Um, but yeah, I think his sizing was also a little small. So so yeah, Ice, Ice Jack, you can't really be comfortable even like on this kind of a flop. You won't be uh, super happy with with where you're at. But I don't think you could fold it. I didn't I didn't actually look at the three bet sizing, but um I don't remember considering folding. Um so I, it must have been I must have been up there somewhat. 
Right. So then take me through the hand. So Helmi checks, you check behind, which, which seems pretty standard. When Helmi leads here, what's your thought process? Because clearly you would assume that he might continue all his aces, you know, betting pretty small. So uh, is, is this something where you think he's going to have a lot, a lot more, you know, big pairs smaller than an ace in his range? Yeah, that seems like super likely. Um, that just also makes sense, uh, sense with the with the with the preflop sizing, like kings and queens. Um, there's also going to be the occasional a6 in there, or it's not not completely unlikely. Um, if you want to, if you want to think about like worst case scenarios, it could be could be aces. It could also be like you know, if it's three eight offsuit, it could also potentially be like five nine offsuit or deuce nine offsuit or something silly. Um, but yeah, once again, um, I don't have ace king in my range. Um, I probably have ace queen, but like ace jack is like super high up there. Um, I'm not. It's not really for me. The hand to the river plays plays itself, right? Like I can't. I'm not gonna fold ace jack preflop. I'm not gonna fold it on the turn. Um, so yeah, just like it, an easy one out for me. Um, and I could have considered value jamming, but with how polarized I consider, I probably considered or might I might have considered uh, Phil to be. Um, yeah, it doesn't really make sense because he's gonna have a lot of give ups. I also remember if I would, there's a chance that he uh, checked incredibly quick on the river, which, which you know, also is either like a give up or a trap, like once again, like a polar polarized uh, action. So, so yeah, that's those. Those are probably the reasons why I decided to check back the ace check there. Right. So there's one <laughs> one point nine million in the middle there on the river. Um, is there any sizing he could pick that makes you fold? Oh yeah, if you if he follows through on the river, I'm. I'm with with the image he has. I'm probably willing to fold. Right. Like I don't think that doesn't seem crazy to me at all. So you know, obviously, you know, the ace flops, so you continue. If a jack flops, you continue as well. Um, but you know, in general, <laughs> take away the fact that you know he has a three offset, which is a horrible hand. But do you think that playing back uh, in in Helmut's position with the reputation that he has is in generally a good idea and then as an as an attachment to that question do you think he makes a mistake by not committing more after the flop because of that image yeah um i think it's an okay idea to co to um to play the image if you ex if people expect you to be tight um then then sure try to not be tight makes sense um but you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't uh, follow through and then choose a three off suit off suit as a, as the three bet. Like what are you gonna like? You know if you if you choose three six suited in the same spot, those hands are gonna make it more likely to for you to have a you know reasonable spot to to uh, to follow through with. At least have a have a gut shot when you put into two streets. Um, but if his read is that I'm giving him a lot of credit um, and I'm gonna fold to one step a lot. Uh, to a single battle lot, then then it's fine, and he might have been right. I'm just not in a spot where I have to show that I'm, you know, I'm sticky. I just like I have a good hand preflop. I make a top pair. That's not how how I can prove that his line was losing. He might have made money in the line. He just, uh, yeah, I just had easy decisions. Right. Um, one one of the themes that comes back around every time I break down one of these streams, correct me if I'm wrong, is that poker in a lot of ways just comes down to playing good hands. Or is that some, is, is that is that just an outlandish thing to say? Um, yeah, I mean, especially if you like the the, the selection with it. You know, if you all, all, always talk to the winners, um, those were probably the people who who did have the best time because like you don't win a tournament by by bluffing, right? You kind of it's easier to win a tournament if you kind of do bluff, but in the spots where you would usually bluff, you actually have it. Uh, and people pay you off, um, so so yeah, tough. Um, so yeah, so yeah, but it also does help to put put in money with good hands, or like generally, even if you don't have a good hand, you put in the money in spots where you could have a good hand, or where you're like more likely to have a good hand than the other person. Um, that's kind, that is kind of how the game works, and yeah, if you if you do end up winning it, then that was that must have been a big um, big part of the recipe. Yeah, it is funny because if, if I ever release a strategy book, it's going to be one page and it's going to say, just play good cards. And then at least yeah. you're, you're, you're ahead of most people. Uh, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly how the game works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, yeah. We would also... Go ahead. If you, if you would do the same, the same show, but you always do it with the, with the bubble voice of a tournament, 
<laughs> then it would probably be the yeah, don't play don't really play uh good cards like right you know, just just wait it out <laughs> be a little more patient patience is number one rule can you imagine the torture if I did this show with Dan Shack? He's the first to bust, and then he has to sit through another 90 minutes of him not being at the table. Yeah, I mean he's a he's a he's a bad example because he's like a champion. He's got he's gonna he's gonna take it and probably enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, for for most other people, that would be very hard to do. Yeah, uh, we just saw Dan Shack get eliminated by Fader Holtz. Dan Shack had the King Jack. Fader made the call with Ace Nine and sent him to the rail. So we lost one player. Action continues. Bryn Kenny, who's been rather quiet so far, raises it up with the ace-10 suited. Berkey defends uh, from the big blind, I believe, with 5-4 suited. 5-4 um, suited, the, those small suited connectors and, and small pairs, um, it seems to me as though they have lost a bit of their value um, with everyone running the sims, or am I off on that one? Um, yeah, I mean... With the whole, um, like a lot of the value of um, of small suited connector and a small small gap suited connectors was like, yeah, it's people's favorite hands or something, you know, like Daniel Negriano likes to sweet three six suited. And yes, if you uh, if the game gets more um, scientific, you realize actually three six suited is not that great of a hand. Also, in te in tournaments when the stacks get shallow, um, those those suited hands lose. You know, lose even more value. Like it's, it's nice. It's nice to make top pairs in poker. You don't make a lot of top pairs with four or five suited. That's a problem. Um, but yeah, deep in deep stack poker, it's still it's still a su it's still a super valid hand. But yeah, I mean, it's people just like suited connectors, and what people like is less of an less of a less of a um, strategy now than it was a few years ago. Right. Um, over here, the hand that Berkey plays, uh, Kenny continues for 140 after the flop, and he check raises all in for 695. Is that a defensible play uh, given his uh, equity and, and, and the way the hand played out? To check raise all in there with the, with the flush draw? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's it's big blind against button or cutoff or something, right? I think it's, I think it's underground plus one against bi uh, big blind. Uh, Berkey calls from the, yeah. from the big blind. Yeah, you obviously you need some you need some um, some fold fold equity there, but it doesn't seem you you probably always do have it. And how how bad is it supposed to be to put it to put it in with a flush draw? And this is also the kind of flush draw that is um, very hard to play any other way, right? Like if you if you just call, there's like a lot of flush draws that have like an additional gut shot or an additional a side or king eye that maybe you can call a turn suit as well. But this one, um, so I'm sure he splits his his flush draws in some way. And this is just where you know you bet and you hope the other guy folds the queen jack. And if he does the fold the queen jack, that's that's a great that's a great scenario because queen jack still has like very good equity and might actually win the hand if you don't raise. Right. Uh, in this hand, Helmut raises before the flop and uh, Fedor defends Jack for suited from the big blind. This is one of those moments where you know we could see a Helmut blow up if uh, Fedor goes to showdown with Jack four suited, which clearly is not in Phil Helmut's book of poker. Uh, it goes check check on the flop, and then um, action is now on Fedor on the turn. He checks again, having a four. Helmut makes the queen on the turn. Let's see what sizing he goes for. Oh, he checks behind. Interesting. Third diamond, but a second pair hits the end for Helmut. Interesting situation for Holtz. I think it's quite clear that Helmut plays a lot of his ace high this way. And it feels like Phil almost wants to check. Yeah, and perhaps troubled by the idea that he may not get called by a hand up. that he has beat, but also, he's going to bet 200k also, into 420. And also troubled by the idea that it, it really doesn't look like he has a flush or a straight, so his hand is a touch face up. However, he has the strongest of his, quote, face so it makes it look hand. painful. Yeah, I was going to say, why, I mean, what, what, what is Fedor thinking? I mean, he's smiling. He, he, he clearly is trying to make up some kind of range, but it seems pretty tough here yeah. to have any, any sort of uh, chance. Yeah, for sure, especially against somebody who's been opening super reasonable. Like, you know, you can also only consider making a call if, you know, somebody, if he's three bits, eight, three offsuit, he might also open the eight, these kind of hands, and then suddenly, you know, a pair is a pair. Um, and it doesn't really matter which one. There's just like always going to be so many, so many random combos out there that against the half pot size sizing, it's just like, you know, you put it in and you, you run against one of those. 
Um, but yeah, I don't think Phil has shown that tendency ever really that he's opening out of line. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I think, I think this was more like a, maybe it's also like a bit of a show thing, right? Like you don't want somebody to, to uh, get the feeling, you know, you can just like fold him out of a hand. You, you want them to sit to the, to the pain a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Just in case he is bluffing. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, uh, Timo comes in hot again with another question on uh, Facebook. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, he says, who is harder to play against, the older pro players or the, tr um, the traditional style or the newer young players, pro players, using modern techno technological statistical tools to make decisions? Timo, I can, I can go out on a limb here and, and make an assumption here, you know, based on the wording that you used as far as the strength of the opponents. Mm. But um, Reiner... Let's, you know, you of course you can answer the question, but also let's take into consideration uh, perhaps a bit of the explanation of what it's like to play against some of the more old school pros. Yeah, I mean, first of all, old school, old school pro. Yeah, it's 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 not really a fair a fair comparison um, to to like yeah I obviously play somebody who's who has been like very successful years ago over somebody who's very successful now. Like that seems, that seems like a, like a given. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like, especially like in this time when you, when you come up, it's usually because at this time you have a very good idea of what the old school pros do, what, um, you know, what works against them very well. Um, so I personally always really enjoyed uh, playing playing um, playing these guys, even though like you know, especially somebody like Eric, who's who's uh, 2016, 2017, still always had like huge years and uh, big scores, and I was always like super competitive, um, and wasn't easy to play at all. But like you know, if, if I if I play heads up against him or if I play heads up against um, somebody who's like yeah, playing playing millions of hands. And exactly heads up every year and it's not really a fair not really a fair fight right um all over here we have Bryn kenny moving all in and uh fader makes the easy call with pocket jacks we have sevens against jacks Bryn kenny's tournament life on the line fader has him covered by quite a margin six outs heading into the river let's see if kenny can stay in this tournament else and he will be finishing in sixth place kenny hit the six outer on the river here it comes. No, it's the eight, and Jacks up holds mm -hmm. as Bryn Kenny will be awarded eight hundred thousand dollars for what I think Nick, you'll all. agree with me, was a very valiant showing. Sixth place for Bryn, eight hundred k in the bank. Not a bad showing, but clearly he was hoping for more. Has he got Berkey? Fun fact: hmm? This guy also uh, moved on to be very successful in poker after this tournament. <laughs> yeah, Bryn Kenny definitely. Um, one of those players actually how would you describe him and his style because he always talks about you know he doesn't talk to many people he doesn't do much studying he's more of like you know he, he always re uh, refers to his photographic memory as one of his biggest and strongest assets um how do you look at Bryn as a player um i don't know i mean also he's, he's been uh, super successful for for so long he wouldn't be like my I like, you know, I don't think he's like necessarily the best poker player in the world. Um, so he does, he's not like on that list um, for me. Um, he's just, you know, I've seen a lot of fans where I just don't don't agree with, um, but I don't know the thought process necessarily. And I don't know which kind of, um, yeah, adaption to information he has, um, he's, he's been doing, I guess. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, yeah, he's, he's solid. And I also think he's... Um, it's a it's a different w difference with him, like how high how high the buy-in is, for example, and he's gonna make sure to to show up in in a good um, in a good shape for for like the for the big ones. And yeah, he's, he's done that. As far as who the top players are right now, um, are there certain names to come to mind when I say that? Are there, are there certain players that stand out in your mind? Certain opponents that you've had over the last few months that really you know put you to the test in in, in a special kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it too dangerous to give these guys credit because you know you're going to be facing them all the time? <laughs> no, it's also usually the toughest ones you don't like, so you don't want to give them public uh, <laughs> a public shout out. So that's 
that's that's one issue. But I do actually think that um, that this year and 2017, um, Fedor was probably the toughest the toughest to play. I think the uh, the edge that he had back then, um, I don't know. I don't think that's that's possible in today's fields and why actually do like obviously his one was still out of this world. Um, but yeah, I just felt like he knew a lot more. Uh, he he just knew in sports where he shouldn't have known. Um, and that's yeah, that's a valuable skill. Right. Uh, yeah. As far as how much of that is, you know, talent or how much of that is hard work, how much of that is, I don't know, discovering something new in the game. Like how, how do you, how, how do you, I don't know, get so far ahead as far as, you know, what Fader did back then? Yeah, I couldn't tell you. Um, I mean, he's, it's obviously both. Um, he worked out, he's, um, He's, uh, he's he's talented for it. He had like a good group of people um, around him, like like this guy. Um, this guy's pretty clever too. Yeah, yeah. Business administration. That's where that's where you get the skills. Um, but but yeah, I don't I don't I, it doesn't make it doesn't completely make sense to me. I think a lot of it is is it's just like how people um, how people how people see you. Like if if everybody is afraid of of one person and play accordingly and they all you know when people uh have fear fear or something all of them kind of do the same or similar things right and he's going to be the one who has like who has like the upper hand because he's been in this situation because everybody is is fearful against him or something like that right so you can just like um you can get a lot out of it we are we're in a flip here. Yeah. So talk to me about this hand because Berkey is 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 known to limp a lot more than the average player. He limps the button here. I believe he had been doing that quite a bit in this tournament. He limps. You raise small blind with pocket sevens. He jams and you snap call with the sevens. So walk me through the thought process here. Um, how many? What's the big blind that do you know? That is a great. We can probably figure that out. Uh, I think he limped. So that's uh, 60, 30 k sixty k. So you make it two hundred five. 20 picks. And then he shows uh, for Yeah, I mean, once once again, for me, the hand plays itself. It's like 20 big blinds, small blinds against button. I have put pocket seven at this point. You know, we we hope he has pocket sixes or like he could have like ace, a lot of ace queens. Like once I raise it and I have to raise it with, with this with this holding just to get out um get out the big blind and to not um give him such a good price on like, you know, seeing a flop with I don't know, random 10 8 type of hands. Um, and once yeah, once he jumps, I have the equity that I need. So for, so uh, yeah, for me this is not this this is a very easy spot. Um, his play is probably probably fine as well. He gets like some additional value from from lower pockets, from uh, from some Broadway hands, um, from the occasional bluffs, and he loses some uh, value against Fedor just getting to check back his ten three of diamonds and like I me or me completing my Jack eight offsuit, which I would fold against the race or a gem. Uh, so it's a, it's a fair trade-off. Um, yeah. But in general, you don't see open limping, you know, very frequently. Berkey definitely, you know, is a very successful player. He adopted that style. How, how do you feel about that? Because you, you're saying right now, you know, you can sort of go either way with it. Yeah, I mean, the problem with limping and final tables is just that what limping what limping usually does, does range-wise is you're you're, um, it's possible for you to VPIP a wider range profitable. Um, if you only raise, if you if, if every time you're putting in two big blinds, you can play less hands than if you put in one big blind every time. Um, but now it, the the situation is on a final table. It's not really that profitable to try to play more hands. Um, so especially on the final table, limping limping is um, yeah is is more feels more like it's more like a, an exploit than the than the right strategy whatever that means um but but yeah like for 20 20 big lines outside of icm i do think that it's um it's super valid to to try to get into pots and ace nine suited like you know th those kind of fans uh, it's you you when when people are like big stack ace nine suit is not the not the best the best example for it um, but generally speaking, you don't want to raise for the ton of ton of equity. And when there's like a lot of other short stacks out there, ace nine suited becomes like a very very thin race call. And by limping it, um, and therefore potentially increasing increasing fold equity, um, yeah, because I'm probably raised folding some hands that I'm re-jamming against his 
is raised. Like I'm not sure the spot is the perfect example for it, just because Fedor is probably fairly deep as well. Right. Um, but yeah, the 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 thought process makes sense um, to to uh, to um, to construct the limping range in, in those spots with these stack sizes. So as far as your as your raised folding range, are we thinking of you know king jack offsuit in that sort of you know area? Yeah, it's probably going to be a little mm, tough. Tough to say. I think I'm. I, I'm actually thinking I would have uh, approached the the hand a little more polarized again, like um, isolating king six offsuit instead of king jack offsuit, and then um, then yeah. I mean, in theory, I should probably just raise call off like king jack offsuit type of hands um, with with player tendencies back then. I just think people were too tight to do it, and you could get away with maybe potentially even raise folding king jack, which you couldn't do nowadays. Right. So, so the game has gotten more aggressive, is what you're saying. You need to be more willing yeah, to commit. Sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can't you can't make like big folds just get get a lot tougher because you just don't have the people are people are yeah getting getting more aggressive and and therefore you just can't really know. Like people are just also good at finding the bluffs when they need to find them. Um, and that hasn't always been the case. There was a, there was a, just like situations where, where without a solver, it's tough to think that far ahead on the flop to know which kind of hands you need on the river to f still find bluffs. Like, you know, you, if you, if you start betting like your, your strong pairs, your open and straight draws and the flush draws on the flop, and then both the flush and the straight draws get there. It's suddenly it's super hard to find to find bluffs. You best kind of have to um, think of that beforehand. And I think at this at this point of the game, um, yeah, not everybody was was thinking that far ahead. Right. Do I have Jack nine? Did I make a straight? There it is. A There's a straight. Life's easy when you make straights. Um, I was not paying attention to the action in this hand, but I was I was listening to you talk. So we arrived on the turn here with Helmuth having the ace deuce. He's Looks as though he's going to try to make a bet here. I'm not sure what uh, what happened pre-flop either. It looked like a little like check check on the flop. It does. He bets the turn here, 340 into 640. Uh, for the people who are just tuning in, this is Run It Back. We break down epic footage from the past, and today I'm joined by the 2016 Super High Roller Bowl champion, Reiner Kempe. Um, you know, listen to what this guy has to say. He is one of the best players in the world. So if you have any questions about poker strategy or about anything else regarding the game, please do send those questions in. And don't forget to like this video. It really helps us a lot. Liking this video is kind of like feeding me. You know, my fridge is empty. I need some likes. I'm going to eat all the likes. I really appreciate it. Uh, so that is something that I would love to have. Uh, 10 on the river here. Um, the straight still strong, but a third club and a board pair. Helmut's range definitely includes some of the hands that connect with this river card. Um, you know, knowing Helmuth a little bit and how he plays and how he loves those big cards. In this case, however, he has ace deuce of hearts. Doesn't have it, Reiner does, with the straight here. Let's see what Helmuth decides to do. Some of my friends, the real old school guys, capable of checking this straight here. Just with three clubs out there in the yeah, paired board. Just, just making that read, you know. 425,000. 425,000. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, they want to play every hand against me. They just keep getting there. It's so sick. He's now they're trying to give me the money. Yeah. I'm just going to take it, but Jesus. How do they just keep sucking out? They think I'm not going to show them the nuts. So brutal. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know the action... Um, I don't even know the position, so I can't really say that. <laughs> but what, what I am what I am curious about is, is this just Helmut's frustration, or does he also think that before that the river hit, you know, he he somehow could could get away with um, this winning this hand in some kind of capacity? Like it's it's really strange to me sometimes when he goes off. Like you know, when he has aces and there's five diamonds and he doesn't have any diamonds, and I totally understand. But in this case, he only has ace deuce hearts. Like it doesn't, he doesn't yeah, have yeah. anything. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. And I, yeah, as I said, I don't even know. I don't, I don't know the spot. I didn't see the hand. Um, but yeah, that, it probably just adds up. It's probably just a general lost three hands in a row, and 
And like the hands we played against each other so far, if I didn't miss one, was like his A3 and his A2s. But it's not, you know, there's, there's only that much complaining you can do about those those one outs. Right. Uh, um, look at this hand between you and Fedor potentially. He makes it 140. You're in. Is it. Where's the button in this hand? I think he opens for one of the gun. Oh. It's actually crazy how many how many hands I feel like I kind of remember. I think I make I make trips in this one, and um, have to fold have to fold the river. Or do, I don't fold the river, but I feel like I could or something. Right. So he raises under the gun with ace queen. You defend king do suit it. Uh, we're playing four handed, which is of course um, a massive factor as well in how these hands play. So was that was that big blind anti? Yes, definitely big blind anti. Yeah, because definitely I'm. I'm gonna while you talk about this hand, I'm gonna find it. So this hand in, in, in general though, defending the king do suited, is that you know a sort of a standard approach? Yeah, I mean we're playing we're playing four handed at the time. So this looks like another gun, but it's still cut off a uh, cut off open race, suited king is a, is a super super strong hand. Um his yeah, he obviously didn't didn't hit like super well, um, but still has all the strong the, the stronger kings. He has uh, the stronger jacks. He has the uh, the over pair. So generally, I have a lot of give ups. He kind of doesn't, um, just because of random seven eight offsuit type of combo. So betting makes sense. And um, so the so the uh, the real things where you could go either way is kind of a turn here, or like yeah, on the flop, it feels fairly standard. I didn't see the sizing. It could probably go bigger in Fedor's shoes, but and it also makes sense to to be cautious when you when you have two point three millions and there's two other people with like slightly less chips. Yeah, so Fedor bets one one ninety five on the on the flop there to bring us to the turn. You check call. Um, are like I don't know. This is this this is one of those spots where in either one's shoes. It, this is tough because I'm not a player on this level. But for Fedor, there's arguments to continue. But, you know, ace-queen sort of picks up some showdown value, I'm guessing, as well. Um, you're going to have, you know, quite a few draws in your range that he's still ahead against at the same time. Yeah, it's probably not It's probably not actually... Uh, may, might not even be that that money, many. I don't think he's getting to showdown a lot with the ace-queen. Um, just it doesn't help to block queen-10. And then there's only the spade was left, which I raise some on the flop. Some of them I raise on the flop. So so yeah, it's probably just but yeah, you don't want to bet for the equity because this queen still has like the, the three outs to the nuts plus the additional ten for, for a very strong straight. Top pairs are gonna be good a good amount of the time. Um and the queen will actually help as well. Um so it's probably not for showdown value, but it's just like realizing your equity kind of check back, because uh, bet folding will actually still hurt. So in this spot here, you're obviously thinking value, um, the the spade. How how much does that worry Fedor in this sense, or you know, are spades just not very common in your range there? No, I do think I, I have plenty. I I do have plenty of of flushes left still. Um, think yeah, it's definitely something he's he's worried about. There's also a good amount of full houses out there, um, so I don't think. Like he's not feeling, he's not feeling like he has the stone cold nuts there. Um, so I don't think he would have raised the river if I had decided, if I did have decided, if I had decided to jam, uh, to bet. But I probably thought like it's it's my weakest, it's it's uh, the weakest king I could possibly have. Um, he has ten is good for him just because ace ten gets there. He might put in another bet with uh, queens or ace jack himself on the river. Um, and yeah, I checked by the oh, yeah. way, and it, it was the regular antis in this tournament, yeah. So, in, in this case, as far as uh, sizing goes, before Fedor throws it out there, what sizing would you like here from Fedor? Yeah, I don't think he, he's gonna go, he's gonna go small a lot there. I think he's gonna go like something. I, I don't think he can over bet a lot either, so it's gonna be a random. 75% kind of bet. I don't, I don't think there's too many too many reasons to do otherwise. I think that Holtz knows 
that if Kempi has a king or even a jack, he might call a rather substantial bet. I think this is one of these spots. This is a classic bluff card, the ten of spades. And I do think Holtz will size up his bet here. Notice he's using an extension, so he's clearly giving this a lot of thought. So just take me into the mind of a player like yourself. In that moment, when you're sitting there, you know, thinking and you're using a time bank, are you thinking out loud, you know, running through combinations? Or do you almost immediately know what you're going to do based on having seen scenarios like this before and all you're doing no. is sort of posturing? Yeah, and those, no, and those catcher spots... And those catcher spots, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a lot of counting, and you don't you don't know for sure. Um, but I just I just would like to know if I did I I looked like super annoyed when he bet, but I would just like want to know if if I was already annoyed when he just like did he announce something because like I got annoyed before he actually put up the chips, so I would want to know if he announced it or not. Let's see. A rare over bet. It does look meaty. I don't think he said anything. To be about 450-ish. 465 bet 465,000. 465,000 to be exact. So you're you're saying that you should be able to find a fold here? I I mean no. I mean I don't think so. He could still have like there's plenty of potential bluffs, right? Like he could be attack, attacking my Jack X with um with like random ace five of hearts you know or a six of hearts a seven of hearts a eight of hearts. there are so many comments that he could potentially love he could even bluff like pocket sixes or something um because like once because so much of my um of my of my um range improves here right like i don't really have a lot of weak hands left anymore so he's gonna turn he could potentially turn all of those um into bluffs my flush does get there's my straight draws um improve to a pair at least uh, so i think nowadays this is like a super clear call and once again people weren't aggressive enough and you could make absurd faults i don't think this is i i, I do i do already know i called um but just the fact that i you know believably make the impression that i might fold the scent shows that that yeah i mean for that's a that's a kind of an absurd fault to make because yeah just because it's trips is a good hand I mean, it's better for TV to make a hero fold every now and then, but then you have to be right, like this spot. Um, mm. But it, it is interesting that you're immediately frustrated, which, you know, to someone who doesn't play at high stakes or someone who's, who's a casual poker player watching the show, they might see this yeah. as, you know, trips in this hand with not a ton of betting it looks like such a strong car, a strong hand. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think I was, that was a big reaction for me. I'm kind of surprised to see that as well. I mean, your, um, your eyebrows are almost covering your whole eyes. You're like, oh, this, this is the classic head bobbing of like naming combinations in your head. Like, yeah, I want, I want everybody to know that I'm, you know, that that's what I'm doing. Doesn't he? I felt like you could really see his mind working and the, and the pain. I thought we were referring to the. Hogwarts Ensemble. <laughs> I mean, you are burning through quite a few of those time bank chips, and those are quite valuable as well, knowing how much you still have left to play. Yeah, I think, I think, I hope, I think I only put in one, maybe two. I think one of them might have been Fedos because he also pulled out one before, um, before betting. Would also possibly they're taking a risk in this spot. Right, there are times... Yeah, uh, and you saw that he calls. winces right when he says he calls. It's as though he knew. In a no-limit cash game, Holtz could easily size up there with kings and jacks. Sometimes turn hands into a bluff. A lot of things could be going on, but... Kemp you look like you just got eliminated. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's... That's a big reaction. On this all is, streets, really. This is the most I've seen from you as far as reaction goes in, you know, as far as I can remember. Yeah. Um, is is that a show of, of of pressure? Is that just something of like not wanting to make a mistake because of how big the moment is? 
Um, I, yeah, I think this just wanting the, to do the one thing and having to do the other thing because at the end of the day, Pedro is obviously way too good of a player for me to make absurd folds against him. It's just like, yeah, if he got if he has it there, then that's fine. Like it's not like yeah, even for you know, even out of my kings, right? Like it's King Deuce is, has to be a better catcher than most other most other kings really because it just doesn't bluff any kind of um of opens that he will he's gonna turn into a, a bluff on the river. Obviously any yeah. So it's it's yeah, I don't know. It's um I'm I'm surprised to see it that way. Um it's probably just it's it's probably just being being silly somewhat. It's just uh, I kind of feel like he has it. I can never make the fold. And in the scenario in this spot, I'm I'm annoyed that this happened. Um but also I mean it's also a big pot, right? Like it's it's like for four stacks in a 300k, it's like doesn't look like a lot of chips, but you know the the potentially best play on the table just uh, increase the stacks 70 percent, 60 percent, sitting sitting to your direct left. Like it's a big pot. It's a bigger pot than than you would think when you just like look through it. Um, but yeah, I mean in this one, you call it, you're done with it, and you keep your diamonds. Right. So in this spot, we pick up the action on the flop. It's you with queens against the sixes of Phil Helmuth. Um, you bet on the flop, which leads me to believe you three bet before the flop, but we did not see the action. We, we just jumped in on the flop there. Um, you bet small on the flop, though, and Helmuth makes the call <laughs> there. Um, kind of curious to see how this plays out because, you know, clearly the ace is uh, a card that slows things down when you have pocket queens. still think that Kempi can imagine a range of hands that Phil would do that with and, and Warren continuing on this turn or Phil to allow While we watch Helmuth tank here, uh, shout out to everyone in the chat. I really appreciate you guys all being with us. Helmuth bets only 80k. I'm very curious to hear Reiner's thoughts on this uh, in just a second. Uh, please keep sending in your questions and your remarks and don't forget to like this video. I really appreciate it. Carlos says, great interview. Carlos, I appreciate it. For everyone else who is enjoying the show, I really appreciate it as well. And please uh, do let me know where you are watching from. We had a very international audience last week. I Hopefully it's the same case again today uh, i think the aussies might not be with us today because of the time zones but i'm pretty sure we have lots of europeans watching today um timo is saying two old timers versus two youngsters seidel and Helmuth against reiner and fedor um this hand i believe when check check on the river and the queens of reiner take it down Helmuth not pleased at all he is uh, extremely distraught, but yeah, it doesn't help when you don't pick up the right cards there. Um, let's talk about Eric Seidel for a second here. Eric Seidel, famous from Rounders, losing heads up to Johnny Chan. That, of course, was in that movie, the 1998 classic with Matt Damon and Edward Norton. Um, Seidel has been around forever. He's done it all. He's won it all. He's had much, much success, uh, even in the modern era of poker. I believe 2012 was maybe his best year. Um, how do you look at someone like Seidel, Reiner? Like, do you still see him evolving? Do you still see him, you know, you know, um, getting into the more modern approach to, uh, to the game? And and what's it like to play against someone who was already playing the main event when you weren't even born yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's um, like in comparison to to Phil for to Hamid, for example, he's always like like he just like sits there and he's trying to like figure figure out, and he's like kind of. It even feels sometimes like he's like looking up to like the newer to new guys uh, coming up. Like he's really curious, curious, and tries to tries to uh, pick those pick those things up, um, and like basically, you know, do the things that they are doing. Um, while while Phil obviously has the has the, has this like completely own approach to it and wants to do it his own way and wants to just um, yeah disregard uh, other other approaches to some extent and. Uh, and Seidel really hasn't uh, doesn't do any doesn't do any of that. He just like tries to uh, to learn as much and uh, and and uh, get better. And yeah, that's why he's he's been around for as many years as he as he has. Um, yeah, legend of the game, obviously, poker hall of famer. Double up there for Seidel against Fedor. He was short. I do like that business casual for Seidel as a lumberjack a flannel, which I can highly appreciate. Uh, <laughs> That'll work. Yeah, exactly. Um, next time it's business casual for you, uh, I expect you to show up in a flannel. That, that, that's definitely a good look. 
I don't do the I don't do the bottom up things. Oh, like even on a, even with the suit, I'm I'm going I mean, I'm wearing t-shirts. I'm not, so I'm, not loving not loving the style. I'm expecting you to have a walk-in closet with basically every single uh, color on the on the color spectrum, but the same shirt. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of true for both pants and shirts. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, all right, seven five suited. One of my favorite hands. See, there you go. There, See? there you go. Yeah. It, you can't. That's, that's you, it. You can't. You, there, it just feels right. It feels right in some kind of way to play five seven suited. Um, it's like so many nice scenarios. Like, what's going? What's the best thing with that's going to happen with Ace King? You flop top pair, and then everybody knows you have Ace King. Not seven five suited. Exactly. Exactly. You know, just put you know two fives on the board, or you know two hards with the back door straight draw. You know, there's this. The, they won't know what hit him. Exactly. The possibilities are endless. Uh, in this case, you raise to 175. Fedor makes the call. He is in position. Um, let's see. He has ace eight suited. Oh, that's that's easy easy poker when you flop trips. See, that's why Fedor is so successful. That'll help. It's probably kind of interesting from my perspective. I don't think he has like significantly more eight x. I, but I do think his range might actually be stronger than mine just because. I'm opening into the two short stacks and he's gonna, as the mid stack, um, be, you know, very careful what he's putting chips within. So I don't think I'm gonna like, necessarily see by the bunch here, but seven, five of hearts is, you know, besides folding out, you know, all the king jacks and, uh, and the ace x without the vector flush draws, you also have like some hearts and some, um, some fours and sixes where you, you know, get some additional, um, equity. So it's a potential hand to, to follow through with. Um, so yeah, just like betting the flop and see how then it evolves makes seems like an like an okay play. And then it's just one stab and give up. And even if you pick up a back door, it's hope hoping to get the the river. No, I think there's a that's why why I like this this hand because there's a good amount of of uh, of cards that I do follow through with. Okay, that I can follow. Through. Like hearts make sense, fours make sense, six makes sense. Even like clubs make sense just because the, the vector flush draws he floats with um, are going to have to give up. Um, yeah, two of spades. We don't want to, we don't want to, yeah, barrel off with no no blockers and no no backdoors. Even like folding fives and sevens at this point is, is also not good because he, he is going to call once and fold on the turn most likely. So yeah, now now this is just just to give up. While we watch this hand play out, um, I'm I'm getting some questions and I'm getting some Australians in the chat. So I appreciate the, the Aussies watching in the morning. Um, Dylan Barry is asking okay. Reiner, how many scarves do you own? I did lose this one. No way. Mm. Uh, I own like probably like. Like I lose stuff a lot, and if you play if you play poker and you travel a lot, um, there's like some fluct fluctuation, something like that, uh, with it. I, and the the problem is you always you keep the ones that you don't really wear that much because yeah, so you you have the ones that you don't like. So I I probably have like five or six or something. Not no not an absurd amount. So are these scarves from you know? H and M, you're on your way to check out. You just pick up a scarf, or is there is there sort of a science behind it? And do you do you have a specific brand? And do you wear like five hundred dollars silk scarves? It's it's not a brand thing, but it's a uh, it's always like really nice materials. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't remember what this one was, but like it was incredibly soft. <laughs> like, the one that got away. Was it was it as soft as as the tournament? Uh, it was really soft. It was incredibly soft. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Are are the scarves still a big thing? Uh, and was this really to hide any any tells, or is it also more of a comfort thing? No, it's it's definitely a, a tell thing. It's just like one less thing to worry about. Um, and here, actually, back then I used to play with uh, sunglasses a lot as well. It's it's still it's my second year in in live poker, playing my first three hundred k. Yeah, I'm not gonna like. I'm gonna try to give away as little as little as possible in those spots. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, so if I had been allowed to play, have to wear sunglasses, I would have worn sunglasses. Um, and, and since I was allowed to wear a scarf, I was wearing a scarf. Um, because yeah, there's been people who've played like 
20 times as much uh, face-to-face poker than I had. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't want to be on the spot. And like, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's tough to control uh, the, the pulse. And even if, if you think you don't have an issue with it, then this is still like a, a specific situation. And like, what are you going to do if it's, um, if it does suddenly happen? You're not going to, it's tough to just do like this. Um, so yeah, it's just, just a com- it's just more comfortable. And I think it's the right play for somebody who, who's just starting out. We got Eric Seidel moving all in here with the Ace Nine suited. You have made the raise with Jack Five suited. Um, I want to I want to ask you as well. Have you ever watched yourself back on a stream or on a broadcast and spotted tells with yourself or or habits that were weird and that you now try to avoid? Mm. I don't think so, but I also I'm not sure I focus on that. Uh, too much actually yeah maybe maybe there was like one or two one or two scenarios where i felt like ah not sure. it's usually when you when i'm like when you when, when you're like super strong and you just like act in a way with your hands and you suddenly realize yeah i'm not sure i would have done the same thing with uh with but even even when it comes to myself it's only it's only theories like i don't know for sure that i would have done it differently I, i can't remember like a scenario i was like wow that's very very obvious and uh, everybody's an idiot for not catching on to it And then the other side of that same topic, do, did you ever spot tells on players from watching broadcasts? And is it a thing where at the highest level, you know, everyone's, you know, you guys are all using the sims and, and trying to get better. But is there an element of improving your live game by studying your opponents? I mean, yeah, there definitely, there definitely is. And certain players do still have like certain, you just, you can't be sure on them. It's not like, it's not like, they bet, they start talking, and they, that means they have it. Like, that, that's not, that's very rarely how it works. Um, but, but yeah, like, especially people who put themselves out there and to do talk a lot, um, like, there's people who, who are, like, really good at it, and then there's people who are, like, not that good at it yet. Um, and that's also on the, on the highest level, and it's just, you know, just the way you put out your, there's so many things. Um, and the nice thing is, when, when I said it about myself, it's only theories, um, it's a lot easier when it's about other people that you just like see it and you're just like, yeah, obviously he had it now. Or obviously he didn't have it. And if you, um, if you see it in a stream, you get like the, the confirmation uh, instantly. So you can like lie to yourself a good amount as well. I feel like lying to yourself is a big part of life in general. That that really helps you through the day mostly. Um, yeah, it makes, <laughs> might make things easier for now. Uh, Ruud Nauta is asking on Facebook, uh, Reiner, how was your relationship with Fedor before you played this tournament? How 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 far back do you guys go? Oh, we 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 um, started playing really small together. Actually, like I uh, think I, I I did my I played I flew to Vienna to play like my first live tournament or like half play a tournament, half visit friends, and he uh, he crashed on my couch. And that was that was like before we were good at poker or successful at it. So he must have been 18 or 19 at the time. And I was, yeah, younger than I am now. Are you, you're, you're still, are you, are you still young or are you old now? How, how do you see yourself? Oh, I see myself as young, but like now I'm, 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 I'm starting to not be sure anymore. All right, we got we got <laughs> we got Helmuth all in here with Queen Jack off against your King Jack off. Uh, Helmuth was very very short coming into this hand, so let's listen in on the showdown and he, see if he we... complete he complete caught he complete and then snapped me off. Oh, so he limped and you shoved and he called. Yeah, but he didn't just call. He like he got he got super excited when calling. Okay, let's let's see that again. What about Ace Jack? <laughs> Disciplined. Helmut should find some oh. all ins here. Certainly, and this is one of those hands that I would recommend shipping with 10 bigs, small blind a big, but Helmut has his style and it has proven effective for him over the years. But I do think shipping here is certainly conventionally considered to be the correct play. And if he thinks that he's limping and then Morning. possibly Call inducing, in. is there a chance that Rainer's going to ever do what he's doing right now 
and not have he the was green really jackal. He was so but, excited. And like the thing is, he was probably right. Like I think he uh, like range like it doesn't look like that way, but range wise, he pro probably did outplay me there. I don't think I would have given him um, credit to you know limb call a lot. So I think I would have gone pretty berserk in the hand. I would have jammed a bunch of hand and that includes plenty of like offsuit queens and offsuit jack x. Um, so yeah, I mean it doesn't. And he would have looked like a you know if he just were a little lucky, he would have looked like a like a like a genius with the with the with the complete snap call. Like um, like 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 the genius him. that he is, obviously. And um, like the, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know no, if, I mean, if you show up there with Jack Nine, then. We're in here for an epic, epic meltdown uh, because the, the nine on the flop. Yeah, he, yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have handled that one well. Um, what, what are the worst hands you're shoving here onto, onto his limp? I, I, I think in this specific scenario, I would have, I was, I was really lucky to have King Jack. I think I would have done it with, you know, Jack five offsuit if needed. Um, I just, I just don't think I would have given him credit for complete calling potentially anything. Like I think there, in my head, there would have been a scenario where he just like folds every hand that he competes with, um, and obviously you don't know those things. But like if that is one potential scenario, then yeah, you can't really jam enough. Um, and I think I would have jammed as close to enough as I could would have found. And yeah, he would have um, yeah, he would have looked, he would have been happier than he is now. But he looks happy. Like the moment it's over, he's uh, he's quality. Yeah, exactly. He goes around, shakes hands, and he sort of cools down a little bit. And I think finishing fourth in this event uh, is huge for him as well. I'm, I'm sort of hoping for a bust out interview in this case. That'd be fun. Um, but no, we move on. Look at these chip counts. Seidel sitting on probably 10, 10 bigs, maybe even, even fewer. Um, you have been cruising up to the top. Poker is easy when... Um, you have a big stack and things keep going your way. You started the final table with 5 million chips. You're up to 9.6 million. Um, oh, really? Pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, once again, like all the hands played, played my way, right? Like just winning sevens against ace nine suited and um, having it with the, the king jack against the queen jack when I could have had so many other hands. Like just, that was a smooth day so far. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, spec like I'm curious as well. You know, when you win an event like this, and you know, we still have some awesome hands to break down, so we'll we'll jump into those. When you win an event like this, what's the what's the celebration like? I mean, as as Fedor hinted when he when he just got in here, um, this was like super exhausting. Like it was four days of playing like poker all night, uh, playing long, first 300k or first super high wall I've ever played. Um, so like the quality of sleep is a little limited as well. Um, yeah, I, I like whenever I won a tournament, I've never been able to uh, to have the energy to to celebrate it. And and yeah, there's also the thing that yeah, it feels it kind of feels weird because for the most part, like you know, when you win a tournament, you were just like luck, luckier than others. And yeah, you can be happy about it, but like the whole celebration thing, uh, I'm not sure. We ended up uh, going to to Aria Cafe for like. Two beers, two beers and some food. Uh, wasn't it was also the beginning of the summer. Like there was, there was work to do. Um, so yeah, that was a very the the party was uh, was very very undeserving. As as far as what a big score does to your life and and your career, and obviously you've had you know plenty of big scores, but does it also you know I don't know. Do you look at a big score? as something that allows you to do something else or, you know, maybe take bigger pieces of yourself, you know, buy stuff, you know, I, I hope you're driving a Ferrari by now, obviously. Um, but, but how do, how do big scores affect you? Um, I mean, once again, like this specific score is a like 13 buy-in score. So like if, this affects you significantly if this changes your quality of life you've probably made a mistake before the tournament started by uh, having too much action of yourself so this is not like a great example but like but like in other tournaments like if you win like a i mean i haven't won a main event but even if, you, if it's just like a big side event with a lot of runners um yeah it's uh, it's like it I've, i don't think i've won a tournament where i felt like um this this changes um 
my my life but i also can't say it doesn't affect my mood like it's you know it's it's nice to it's nice to win tournaments and it's, uh, the feeling stays for a few few weeks ideally and a few a few days if it's going if it's not going great um this is interesting because i did bet the flop and uh, fedor is still in there so you raise okay. before the before the flop and he calls oh maybe i limped and then stepped the flop and he floated once that makes sense Presenting a very strong hand. Well, that was a timing that for a bluff. Yet he did bet those jacks a few hands ago on on nine seven five a something like that. Ooh, I remember he that. Hand. He is, five six of diamonds, perhaps. He could even five six offsuit. I think would take a card off in position. He's used a time extension here. One of only two he had remaining, if I'm not mistaken. Looks like only one plaque left in front of Fedor. He's kind of, if he elects to raise, repping sets, straights. Some two pair, I suppose. Oh my God. All right, what are we thinking here, Reiner? Very difficult spot. Um. I mean, I don't think, like, I, I think I fought it on the turn. I don't think you can. Um, once again, this is just um, taking taking away the, the, you know, not giving your opponent credit that he's capable of bluffing, which you just, you can't comfortably do. And it's like, um, but yeah, in this, in this specific, in this specific scenario, I um, thought I do have a bunch of better hands. Um, I don't have enough better hands, but I do have a lot of better hands. Um, and I just, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's not that easy to have an ace there and it's not that easy to have a gut shot with the ace. So I think folding is, is a yeah, significant, uh, significant mistake, but the hand also never plays, plays out nice. Like it's also the kind of gut shot you're not gonna, even if you do hit it, um, a lot of his bluffs improve because there's a lot of, uh, 10 X in his, uh, his bluffing ways, ways, uh, most likely. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's never going to be fun to go to the river, but I just don't think you can just fold it on the turn, just makes it too easy for people. And especially if somebody is capable, it's, uh, yeah, you just, you can't choose it. Then maybe just ch start checking on the turn with some of your weak aces that you like least comfortable, um, bet calling, but you can't generally speaking in a limp pot, um, you can't bet fold with these kind of sizings uh, on the turn. And how much of a factor is Seidel's small stack? I know you guys are not playing for stacks in that moment, but still, does that affect things? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, um, like this, it's just, it's so much tougher for, for fit on the spot to go, to go walk with it. Um, like, I, did I, did I complete preflop or did I raise preflop? Do you know? We can, we can look. It doesn't be... doesn't even matter that much to uh, to answer to answer your question from from just now. Right. Well, we're, we're, um, we're... It's like yeah, he he's he's super uh, unlikely to put it in. I don't think I, I I kind of think that I shouldn't have too much of a limping range to begin with because just how much of a of how much pressure I can can put on him and the suited aces obviously like most suited hands will do pretty well because you can just like bury bury a lot of one outs um, in ways in ways that make sense. Um, and he's just, it's very, very hard to go broke with him. He needs a lot of equity go, to go broke with 50 big blinds. While if I go broke against him, yes, I lose a big pot, but I will still be second in chips and sit there fairly comfortable. But then um, from, from, from the other perspective is that, do you have to give him more credit for a bluff because he is under more pressure from ICM? And in this case, of course, we see you, we see you um, uh, limp here. So I'm just going to skip ahead again to the next hand to make sure that we... Um, Keep this train rolling here, but does it does it affect his bluffing range that the fact that Sidel is so short? Um, yeah, for sure. But it also affects it. It affects all all the ranges, and he's he's just going to be someone who structures his range in a way that he very rarely has to follow through with it. Like in like raising raising always feels like um, putting putting in more chips, but like when people don't three bet enough which seems like a fair assumption um, in this spot. And it's kind of, you know, you're deciding, you, you're deciding you, the, the pace yourself, there, which is also another problem because he might just do it with a, with a pair and a, with, with a weaker pair than ace, just, you know, to, to get a pre showdown, which makes my, 
I found it even more um, absurd. Uh, so yeah, I'm just like super unhappy with, with with that hand, and he just like got the best of me in that spot, which is fine. Every every now and then he's allowed to. Every, every now, now and then. then. Uh, so uh, Fader raises with queen five suited. Seidel moves all in with queen eight suited. You fold. We don't see your cards. Um, Seidel is way ahead against Fedor in this uh, in this uh, spot. If you have any more questions from the chat, please send them in on Facebook or YouTube. If you do appreciate the content, please hit that like vi video. And Valuable Sandwich on YouTube is saying, like the video if you think Eric Seidel is a beautiful man. Well, that just made me like the video. So if you need any more motivation, look look at that beautiful man. Eric Seidel is, is my father, basically. Like, just wearing the flannel with the floppy hat. Uh, the only difference being he's playing 300k buy-ins. And... My my dad's my I think my dad's like building a a shed or something or he's he's very good with wood like a woodworker it's he'd, pretty cool he'd get there yeah exactly he is a pretty good card player though but not poker um, Seidel uh, needing some help here on the on the flop um, obviously Fedor makes a pair in every hand so that's something you have to just deal with yeah my dad actually just uh, asked me yesterday or two days ago for the first time for for poker advice because he's like been playing some with his students and he's been losing like you know, just the, the five euros the session or something and just doesn't he doesn't want to ruin the family name or something like that that's, that's oh, his words not mine that's funny um what what do you tell someone who's who's a beginner in in uh, in the case of your dad yeah i thought that was incredibly hard like i don't i didn't really know like i ended up um um, sending some, some like just shoving ranges to get like a feeling for positions and like, like you know how how your stack size kind of changes even though it doesn't you know like just with blinds increasing and uh, just to get like a feeling how strong a hand is like relatively in the in the situation. Um, I thought that was like a reasonable way to begin. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th the best I, to ask. I thought you were like, come on, dad, uh, install Pio Solver, watch this Ben CB video and you'll be on your way. Yeah. No, no, no. But it but is. Yeah, he, I mean, he's been, he's also been watching some, some footage. Like he usually watches it after I played just because uh, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's more relaxing to him, for him. Um, but like, yeah, he, he, he get, I guess he gets how the game, how, how the game is played. But, there we go, Sadel all in with ace seven. You make the quick call with ace ten. Nothing, nothing special there. Uh, two strong hands, three handed, and Sadel of course needs a lot more double ups to get back in this one. Um, does your does your heart rate and your adrenaline go up when there's an all in showdown, or is the hand over then because you've done your thing? It goes up a lot when there's an all in. Like even online, even if you play like several tables like it's just it gets intense when the chips are in the middle and it's out of your control which is weird because like a lot of people um like you know those like when people are afraid of flying or something they uh they, they you know in comparison to driving a car or something for them it's like a big thing that they can't give away the the control and like for, with these kind of things like it's super easy for me if it's like out of my hands like what can i do anyways like let's see what happens but with poker, I've never been able to get there. Uh, it's, and it's like such a waste of, of energy and such a waste of, uh, of like, yeah, it's so stressful to, it's just like so stressful to sweat every all in, especially if you, um, yeah, you cost, cost focus, costs energy, costs everything. Um, but yeah, I've never been able to, I've also never tried, tried too hard to get rid of it, but I definitely have it. I definitely, uh, like this, yeah. Before the river hits, I'm I'm a lot more intense. I feel like a lot more um, stressed than than before the decision, which it doesn't make sense. It's not it's not the the objectively right way to to uh, to think of things. Right, and and I think the audience and and even people in the chat are joking about how you know you guys you know the young guys who are crushing right now are all a bunch of robots. But that that goes to show that you know there's nothing robotic about this experience it is just being well prepared and then when push comes to shove 
your heart's also beating like crazy because the excitement of the moment, but you're just not showing it in that kind of way. You're not going off on any Helmuth rants. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely the case. So you get to heads up, heads up against Fedor. Best case scenario, obviously, for the both of you guys. Does this already feel like a win? Or are you thinking, I, I need to have this trophy the ring obviously a bigger payout but at the same time you know you're playing against your friends so did it become more casual by getting heads up or was there more pressure by getting heads up oh it got more casual for sure like we had a um we agreed on the deal like in the in the short break um we had we had a beer we um we oh there's this coronas in hand yeah i not me i have a I have a Heineken or something. <laughs> um, and I think we also skipped like a blind level because it's just at this point, yeah, this is this is this is the best possible outcome, and uh, now it's just for the fun is fun is a bit much because it's still like on a big uh, on a big stage, and you don't want to look silly and you want to play right poker, but but yeah, like this is this is the the winning feeling, like. The winning feeling doesn't come when I beat beat Fedor. The winning feeling is like right now. Right. So this this is the big win, getting to heads up. But then also, I can only imagine that the the, the needles and the rubs you would get from Fedor in the years to come, if you do lose this heads up battle, would have been unbearable. So th there was definitely a lot of incentive to close it out. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great title. It's also like the the ring itself is actually. Uh, I've been told it's worth like a good amount of money as well. So there's like still there's still like stuff on the on the line and also yeah you you know you're playing you're playing to win it. So this is this is like this is uh, still a competitive competitive game, but it probably would have been uh, the same kind of competitiveness that uh, I've had I would have had if I hadn't come to this interview, but to play soccer soccer instead. You know, it's just like that, the result doesn't matter that much. It's just uh, yeah you will still wanna do the right thing you still want to win it's just with the money of the ta of the table it's it's like we could have both lived with either outcome i think right and now we're playing heads up you raise it up with the king nine suited fader defense with ace eight two very strong hands here immediately into heads up play uh and i and i do see some options here on this flop mm -hmm. me too and I don't really see any wrong options. Probably the strong nines uh, these days. I would bet more often than not. Yeah, I think king nine is going to be a bet. So how good is your heads up play when ninety five percent of the time all you have to worry about is you know nine handed or six handed when you play tournaments? No, but I um my background wasn't wasn't tournaments. It's like it's actually sit in goals and I had like a, an okay um, amount of sample size in in, uh, in heads up sit in goals in 2016, 2015. Um, so I was feeling pretty comfortable. I'm, I think I played more heads up back then than Fedor did, which doesn't that necessarily make me the favorite here. But uh, but yeah, I think I think actually three handed uh, was tougher against him than now. Huh. Maybe. That's very interesting. It's, yeah, I could also be just off. No, but it's interesting because the the difference between three-handed and, and heads-up is one person. But the dynamic and the way the game plays is very, very different, right? Yeah, for sure. And yeah, Fido just has a, has a great talent for recognizing for recognizing those dynamics before you do and just yeah, makes it makes it very hard. And now it's now it's gonna be get more yeah, more scientific. So you continue on the flop, and then Fedor leads the turn when the second nine comes. Um, what's going through your mind? Because instead of you know him representing the nine, you actually have the nine. Right. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because as I said on the flop, um, I was thinking about which nines to bet. While for him, he's going to call all of his nines on the turn pretty much. Like there's not going to be a lot of raising from nine x from his perspective. So you know that leaves me with less nine x than he has. Um, and and yeah, so leading on the turn makes 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 sense for sure. Um, I'm yeah, I don't think calling calling on the turn makes makes too much sense for me. I think it's just like one of the strongest hands I have, 
um, and I can deny so much equity. He can also still have 10x. He could have like six, six x. He could pair all. He could have all those pairs with the gut shot. He could have flush draws, which is never folding. Uh, so I think the right play for me would have been raising the raising the turn, which I did not do. So you call, and then the seven comes on the on the river. Fader checks to you. There's there's obviously one card straight out there, but you know that's probably a way too simple of a way to look at it. Um, how do you how do you assess the value of your hand on the river here? Um, okay, I mean if you if you look at what I have, um, I have like my best hands are probably like some full houses, like I don't know maybe maybe sevens, maybe if I play king nine this way, I play ten nine this way, I could have like tens or something, um, but for the most part my value range is gonna be straights. Um, a lot of like I could have ace eight, I could have like queen eight type of fence. I could also have yeah, like eight six, ten eight, like all of all of those fans. Um and I, I have like all the my bluffs are like king jack type of fence, like a lot of uh, yeah, some certain spades, like all the random like king four of spades, queen four of spades. I'm gonna play like that a, a, a good amount of the time. Um, my sizing is very low, slow, uh, very, very small, which is probably not a thing. Uh, I think this, my sizing is going to be a lot bigger, should be, should be bigger than it is here. Um, but I'm just like, yeah, I'm probably just trying to charge his, you know, a seven king seven type of fence. Um, just, yeah. Or maybe even like six X, he could be leading, he could be leading six X and. He makes it 1.8 million. How do you feel about his sizing? Mm, yeah, it seems fine. That's probably how you how you raise it. Like it puts it puts pressure on my um, like all my bluffs, and it puts pressure on like like my over pairs and my uh, these kind of. I'm always, obviously always going to call my straights, and I'm probably I have to end up, I have to call some other hands um, outside of straights to to not get exploited too hard. One of the hands that I should be calling if I played a hand like this is probably king nine suited. Um, I did not. Which is no. so was the right time in the scenario, but overall, um, like I probably made a, made a mistake on both the turn and the river. Hmm. So explain to me why there was a physical reaction in that hand we saw earlier, where you know, as far as the the pot size and as far as the moment, it seemed so insignificant compared to a moment like this, where you have trip nines on the river and you get check raised. Like you almost. Folded immediately, no time banks wasted. Um, is there such a clear and distinct difference between those two moments? Um, I mean, it's it's two things, right? Like one is that I didn't, like obviously I wanted to fold in this hand and I ended up folding. So from that point, it's just that the thing that made me so unhappy and the other one is that I wanted to do one thing and just kind of couldn't. And so this kind of feeling is... Uh, is a different one and the other one which probably helps just having a beer having a beer and being like a little more relaxed than and the situation calls for is probably not yeah not gonna be in, 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 in my way too much. So in case people uh, aren't paying attention, Reiner is encouraging drinking at the table. That is basically the, the best way to stay relaxed. Um, all, all jokes aside, um, you probably made your best decisions when you're sober. Um, Fader raises it up with pocket kings. You defend there with 10-8 offsuit. Um, I'm just only going to assume here that you know your defend range is going to be very wide because you know I, I, don't, I don't see Fader giving up a lot of buttons. Yeah, there's not that many people on the table. Um, <laughs> And I don't want to make it too easy for for anyone anyone left. So yeah, I'm gonna not fold too many hands. I'm gonna fold some though, especially if this was before big blind anti as we as we checked uh, checked earlier. So there's like with big blind anti suddenly against min race you kind of you know have to be pi any be anything. This was before that, so there there are some folds. Ten eight is not in there. Uh, what's what's the big blind? That's a great question. Thank you. We're about to find out. Let's see. I'm trying to spot it on the table. I mean, that is a nice pile of cash, though. Let's let's just make reference to that. And the ring looks pretty as well. He makes it 275. So, what does that tell us? We can't. Probably 125 big blind. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. You make a pair. That's a good. Then, what? 
And he only has like 20, 25, 26 big blinds. So I'm going to, yeah, I think I'm probably going to, yeah. I'm also pretty sure I, from memory, I'm also sure I, I, um, I raised it. But I also think it's the right play that it gets it gets a lot of value from like any pair he could have. And he also just a lot of non-pair pairs that he is going to continue. Um, we also he might get the occasional three-bet gem from from open and straight draws, from flush draws. Um, then yeah, 10-8 doesn't play great um, as a check call just because, I mean, it's fine. It's like heads up, it's a strong hand. But like in comparison to Jack-10, for example, where you block like an additional overcuff and have like a positive implies against like King Jack type of fence. Um, you don't have all of that with 10-8. So out of the 10x, which I want to raise a lot from 10-8, uh, is, seems like a good candidate um, outside of it not being insanely strong and like, you know, losing value to like Queen-10 or Jack-10 or King-10. Like with those stack sizes, I even even um, even 3-bet, you know, Ace-10, for example. Um, I don't have pocket force in my range necessarily because I might decide to regen them pre-flop. Uh, so yeah, I'm like, I'm very comfortable with that 10-8 is going to be a race like a lot of the time. So, but are you are you raising to to call a shove or is is that you know, is that is that too? Yeah, for sure. So for sure, like we're playing, we're, we're doing this. This is 25 25 big blinds heads up, 10-8 offsuit. I'm I'm happy to go with it. Right. You said this is probably a little thin. Yeah, I don't think it is. I think it's fine. Could be a reversal of fortune here if Rainer Kempe doesn't improve. This is Kempe. our first all-in and call. Kempe really beating himself up over a spot that is certainly close. There you go, Kempe. Don't be too hard on yourself. Top pair playing heads-up poker versus 27 big blind stack. Can we do it, right? Nine. Are you asking him for for how, whether you played the hand right? Yeah. And he said like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you can do that. Uh, I would have called most of the time. He would be our champion. Yeah. Let's see what happens on the turn. It's a nine. Great, great card for Fedor. Now Kempi does not win if he hits an eight. He must catch a ten. Yeah, down from five outs to just two outs, a 10 and a 10 alone would crown Kempe champion. Otherwise, Fedor Holtz going to be inheriting a massive stack. Just no eight. Here <laughs> comes the river. It's a jack and two kings. All right, Fedor doubles up. Um, Luke Crow is is uh, throwing some shade here on in the YouTube chat, but I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, he says, it is so funny how standard moves are getting explained like it's astrophysics. Um, to that, I say is that even standard moves have a lot of complexity to them. That's why, you know, guys like Reiner are playing at these final tables and, you know, me is doing the asking the questions and you are in the YouTube chat. So Reiner, um, is, is there something, um, is there something called a standard move? Does that even exist anymore? Or is there just, you know, so much analysis going into every decision that, you know, the word standard doesn't even apply anymore? I mean, it's, I think it's the, the other way around, right? Like the more, uh, the more science there is to it, the more standard moves become because like, the deviation come, oftentimes comes from different assumptions or like from uh, from different yeah takes on on tendencies or takes on how to exploit whatever it is. Um, so I think yeah the the um the more solved the game get gets it's like you know in a in a in a solved game like everything is a, is a standard move pretty much like a lot of the things are going to be a standard move with certain frequencies but still like everything's going to be a a standard move. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry to what's what's his name, Lou. Yeah, sorry, Lou, for, uh, for, for for dumbing it down or not. But the, but the thing that fascinates me yeah, is that no, but like you use the word standard, but so much more thought goes into hands that become standard because of how much yeah. they're analyzed. So when you use the word standard, it doesn't apply in the same way that it would to someone like myself because standard to me is like, oh, ace king of hearts, I'm all in. That's standard to me. And that's, and that's only because I see ace king. There's no other thoughts in my mind. I'm just like, oh, ace king, oh, I'm all in. So if your standard is based on all this analysis. My standard is based on the cards that I have. 
Well, I mean, you could also break that further down. Somebody who plays less poker, your, your standards is probably not just the card. It's also like the position on the table and the stack size or something. You're probably not jamming for 150 bigs. So there's like, you know, a little little more into going into it as well. Um, so yeah, that, that probably works for, for every level. Um, but yeah. Oh, I'm, I think I'm I'm winning winning back a good good amount. Yeah, exactly. All in and at risk here for the tournament life. Three kings is all you have to dodge here to stay in the tournament. He almost looks like he knows he's getting there. <laughs> he sort of has a, a look on his face that could be read a lot of different ways. Right. Mischievous. <laughs> the turn's an eight. No clubs here. And all Rainer Kempe's got to do is dodge a king. Easy enough, right? We shall see. If he manages that. He'll lay claim to the 8.23 million in That's the like middle. Here comes the river card. It's a five. Up as well, huh? Kempe, just yeah. like that. Nice yeah. double up there. Uh, Joe is asking on Facebook, how much money on the table? They're playing for $5 million heads up. So 5 million bucks on the table and the Super High Roller Bowl Championship ring, which... You know, holds quite a bit of value. I can't tell you how much, but it's a it's a beautiful ring. I think the question might have been at the physical amount of money on the table, and I couldn't tell you. The, the, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't take those. You, you you didn't get you didn't take a brick with you. I don't think so. I mean, no, I didn't. I definitely not from those. I don't. <laughs> does it does it ever become I normal? Does it part. does it ever become normal to hand the cashier a, a brick of cash like that to register for a tournament? Oh, so quickly! It's absurd. Like that's like like because for some reason, I think at the Rio, um, you kind of always buy in with with chips because they don't give poker players uh, ness accounts there, so you can't have it like with the, with the pay from your front balance. So for like the big tournaments, you you always kind of take a take a backpack from the area. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that on stream. <laughs> but in, in general, though, it is it is kind of crazy to see how much money is there because sometimes you see you know guys post on Instagram when they buy in for the million dollar one drop and it's like legitimately like just a truckload of cash. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Laid out there, and it it just it just makes the money seem so insignificant. And you know, for me, you know, being from the Netherlands, when I see euros, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, that's money. When I see U.S. dollars, I'm kind of like, ah, that's not money. That's 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 just funny. I mean also, in euros, you could have like the same amount. That, like, if this is all hundreds on the table, and you if you do it in euros, it's probably would like a, a stack like this. Yeah, like it's, just, it's it's gonna be a less less not less impressive. Yeah, because the five hundred euro bills, those are those are definitely uh, helpful to reduce the they're stack. Thinner. I think they're thinner as well, or like they're getting less use, so there's like you know less dirt between them, so they they stack nice nice as well. Oh, that's funny. Uh, people on YouTube are hoping for a heads-up battle between you and Lou. I, I would love to see that as well. That'd be that'd be really funny. Uh, <laughs> um, we're still playing heads-up, by the way. You and and Fedor are uh, playing against each other. Um, what I am curious about now, also with you know no live poker happening in 2020, at least up until this point. Um, you know, if you want, you can still play the Venetian, but I'm pretty sure not a lot of people are going to be interested in that. Um, what has your your grind routine? been like you know now that all the live poker has been canceled do you play like 12 tables do you pick and choose and play you know two or three watch a bit of soccer on the side like how do you sort of you know go throughout your days no i've actually been kind of pretty pretty committed to it like i've been playing a bunch of tables and i've been trying to uh, to focus on it so i've been back to like when i when i've been traveling a lot and i only played like um like a, a couple of sessions a year then you know, I just realized how like suddenly twelve tables really seems like a lot. But when you get when you get back into it, when you grind a little lo uh, more, you it's it's fine again. So now I'm I'm playing I'm play, playing a few more again. Um and yeah, it's, it's fun. Like I don't the only thing that's like super annoying is just that um the Sunday to play like the Sunday grind till six a.m. Um it's just yeah that's that part is painful. But besides that, I've been actually really enjoying it. I've been I'm surprised how how um. How easy the transition felt, and how uh, yeah, how much I've been enjoying it, really. Huh, that's crazy. So, would you say that live or online poker is more enjoyable, or do you do you miss the live events a little bit as well? I mean, I think maybe it's just that I like enjoyed being in in Brighton or in Vienna for for the summer. Like, it's just like 
so pleasant in uh, most European places in summer. It's like, you know, it's something that, uh, that, you know, re that I've, I, I've had, I haven't had in a, in a while. And then just having, you know, good people around me and just like, maybe it's just the general lifestyle that I've been, um, that I've been enjoying more than, than, um, than some casinos all over the world for like, uh, for like several years. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're not missing much. It's about 44 degrees Celsius in Vegas right now, um, which is complete misery in case anyone is wondering. Um, but yeah, but <laughs> I've been there <laughs> Yeah, I every know. every summer for the last six years. Exactly. Every summer, that's the case. But yeah, a lot of people are now experiencing what summer is like at home, which is kind of funny. Um, let me look at the chat here. Uh, Chris Bryant is asking, how long did this Heads Up match go for? Um, I couldn't tell you. Um, but it was, it was a uh, somewhat significant amount of time. So it must have been at least three hours or something. Wow. Um, we skipped like we, I think we skipped one level. Um, just agreed on on it, and we kind of. I remember. <laughs> I uh, remember I limped. I limped one hand, and I got like a. I got. I got a look. So um, I. I think we kind of agreed on not playing a limping strategy either, um, to speed it up a little bit. That's really funny because you guys made a deal. That's what you said uh, before Heads Up Play started. Um, Frank yeah. on Facebook is asking, at such a high level, um, edges are small. Are there even exploitable players left or is it all shifted to GTO players? Um, no, there are exploitable players left and like GTO player doesn't mean GTO player. Like right? there is no one who, who, plays, who plays GTO, who plays like the perfect strategy. Um, so that's kind of just not where, where we, where we're at yet. Like everybody makes mistakes. They're just like the size of the mistakes is, is different. Um, and like most, most of the tournaments that run, like, you know, just the, the 10 K, the 10 K this, this Sunday had like seven and a half million dollars in, in the price pool. Like those, that kind of money doesn't come from uh, GTO players, um, only like, especially with Corona and all that's been. A good, a good boom in, in online poker um and yeah like it's not it's not that like it's not you don't make all your money from from playing regulars you don't have to fortunately so the the, the hope but, the hope and dreams are still alive because the the players who aren't studying that 24 7 can still you know win every now and then yeah yeah i mean it's not not getting not getting easier and it's definitely not what it what it used to be but yeah i mean then the numbers are the numbers are great right like the numbers are pretty good um with online poker like like especially with wsp uh, just finishing yeah here's a sizable bet on the river as you made uh trips against fedor's pair of nines he looks he looks a little annoyed It's quite a look. Look at Fedor. He's, he's genuinely befuddled. He's thinking, well, if he doesn't have if he doesn't have a king, I have him beat. <laughs> that seems like a standard thought process. Yeah, I mean, if he's considering, I, like, if he folds this, this would be a problem. Like, just because, just by looking at, like, there's so many, so many potential bluffs that, you know, jump at you. All the like seven eights, ten eights. Jack tens, queen tens, potential clubs like this is so many of them. So if he does decide to fold here, um, I'm gonna feel fairly. Um, I don't know what the word is. Somewhat between embarrassed and choked. Wait, so you're saying that Fedor can never fold here? That's like not not an option. Yeah, I mean, if he if he does decide to fold here, he he like owned me pretty hard in this spot. Hmm. Like even yeah, he can. The best he can do is be frustrated and then call. Yeah, like that's fine. But also, also that would be kind of disrespectful towards me. But like folding would actually be like very very painful. Even now, it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be over. So what does he have? That's a good question. And a question that Fedor is asking himself right now. Fort. 
Oh, no payoff. <laughs> wow. It's like, I mean, maybe, I hope I didn't see the uh, <laughs> see the hand right. Or maybe there was some something in the preflop and flop action that I'm not not seeing. But just from the river action, that seems like a, like an absurd, uh, yeah, fault. Please don't scroll back. <laughs> I won't. I won't touch. The, I won't touch the wheel. That's but that's that's crazy though. So, is that like you know in in his case a hero fault that's based on more than just the ranges because you're saying that it's basically a standard call? Yeah, I mean it's definitely like it. It seemed like it. It must be a very very heavy exploit towards something like. It didn't seem like it would be incredibly hard to get there with bluffs. Right. Um, so. For the people that are thinking that my bike got stolen and all they left behind were the wheels, my bike is right behind me. Ooh. It, it's on the home trainer. So I just did a little training session before we started the show. But I'm very happy that I was I wondering. I was wondering because you said you're doing a lot of biking and like it doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, like, it doesn't seem like the kind of place. Vegas doesn't seem like the kind of place to bike on like a regular basis in, in the summer. Yeah, mostly mostly, mostly indoor. Uh, I have to be honest about that. But also at the same time, when you get out in the morning, it's really, really nice. Like really nice. And, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, you have to use the lights because you have to leave, you know, when it's still dark out. But uh, anyway, let's let's pick up the action here. Fader raises it up with the deuces. Uh, deuces basically only, only really good if you flop a deuce um, and not really that great. <laughs> Uh, if you're playing multi-way. But this is heads up poker. Let's see where this goes. Pocket eights throwing in the race. Also, yeah, it's also a great hand if the other guy folds through the forward jump. Four hundred K with the ducks. This is closest for Fedor. All in. Oh, and he says all, in. all in. Wow. And just like that, Kempi. And a snap all call from Kempi. There it is. Favorite to take it down. Yep. All in and a call. Eights against deuces. The money on the line, the ring on the line. Less of the money, but most of the ring. Yeah. yeah most of the ring. Yeah, exactly. What a moment. Do you do you remember it vividly? This moment. I like this this specific uh, part of the of the tournament. I've like seen a, a few times. Like it just like comes up occasionally. Uh, I don't think I'm not sure. I really remember it too much of it myself. Tend to believe Fedor there, but nonetheless, he's thinking deuce. 10, 9, 5. Running hearts, of course. But if Fedor doesn't help, Rainier Kempi. This is our 2016. Nearly right. Close. Started out strong. And the turn card is a four, <laughs> down to just two outs once for Fedor. Otherwise. Rainer Kempe is our champion. This is for a one and a half million dollar difference between second and first place money. Can Kempe seal it? Yes, Ooh. he can. And Rainer there it is. Kempe is your there it is. Super high Boom. <laughs> Confetti, the bright lights, and then that moment of realization of yes. I do have it. Oh, and Fedor goes for the ring right away to put it on. I, that's that's an awesome moment. That's really cool. For yeah, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a good person to share it with. Right? Just, that could not have gone a lot better. Exactly. Oh, there's the full suit. Oh, yeah, it looks, it looks really sharp. Dominic Nietzsche, <laughs> Dominic Nietzsche did okay. Let's just say that. Um, yeah. I, w I probably wouldn't have uh, trusted only Dom, but his girlfriend was, was with it, and she kind of um, pushed it. That's good. It looks it looks good. Um, for the people that are just tuning into the show, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. Oh, we got Reiner with the winner interview. Obviously, very happy. Uh -huh. um, yesterday, you were down to about a hundred thousand in chips. If I told you yesterday that you are going to be the next champion, what would you have said? I probably would have said it's rather unlikely. <laughs> um, but, you know, I won a couple of flips yesterday and um, I got a few setups today or actually in the end of yesterday and the final table went really, really smooth and winning it against Fedor and heads up made it the more special, I suppose. What kind of opponent was he? Awesome, awesome interview there with the Chana for you with the big win. 
interviews after winning and and sort of being so mentally focused on playing poker for so so many hours is always a tough one but you handle it really really well um for the people that are watching i just want to let you know on thursday i'm back scott siever and i are watching high stakes poker season four some epic clashes between jamie gold sammy farha patrick antonius that's going to be a good time um as you can see here on the payouts reiner can't be taken home five million dollars in this payout fader holds getting in second place reiner thanks again for joining me i really appreciate it i i, I hope you enjoyed reliving this massive moment for yourself yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having me. Like, especially with all the other people you've uh, you've had and you got, you're probably gonna have. Like, it's a good, it's a good line of people to be uh, to be uh, shown shown among. So that's cool. I enjoyed it. it Absolutely. Fun. And the strategy advice that you've given has been very valuable. And I feel like every single time I do one of these shows, I learn just a little bit, ju just enough. I l I'm learning just enough to be able to beat the local one two game. Um, for Reiner nice. Kempi, my name is Rem Kurinkema, and this was running back catch you guys back on thursday uh, 5 p.m pacific 8 p.m eastern and in the middle of the night somewhere in europe so if you guys want to stay up for that you know please do so as well and then let us know in the comments who else you want to see on this show for now peace out and see you guys on thursday